With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast. Hour three. Hello, America. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the United States of America. The phone number is 877 877- Nine seven three seven four two five. Should you wish to call the program, I'm happy to answer your questions. And now we must go where none of us really want to, but it's news, and we must go there. The judge in the January sixth case for Donald Trump has said it. I said earlier March six. It's it's March fourth. March 4th is the trial date now for this case in federal court. Uh, That's the one in Washington. Now, this is the trial date roughly that Fawny Willis wanted in Georgia for the Trump case there. She's not going to get it now. She can't have a trial in Georgia while there's a trial in, in Washington, and now she's looking for an expedited trial. I want to explain to you what these expedited trials are are, are going with. There's a motion in the state court in Georgia for a swift trial. The Constitution has a right to an expeditious trial. And two of the defendants, Sidney Powell being one, uh, Chesbrook and Chesbrook, I think his name is, is the other want a speedy trial, and they are essentially, from what I gather from some of the lawyers, trying to call Fawny Willis's bluff that she really doesn't have a case, and they want to rush her. Now, this is going to be somewhat repetitious for a lot of you, but please bear with me because I do need to explain this again. In Georgia right now, Fawny Willis is trying a RICO case. It's a massive criminal RICO case against a gang called Young Thugs or YSL gang. Uh, Young Thug, I guess, rapper, some such. Uh, anyway, it's it's a big RICO case. Essentially, they're accusing a rapper and a gang of coordinating together different um, appearances and crimes and big RICO case. This is a non-political case. This is not a case involving a former president of the United States, but there are um, multiple defense lawyers involved. They have be- they began picking the jury in January, and they're not done picking the jury. They haven't even begun the trial yet. They're still trying to pick the jury. They've got six jurors left to go. When you have 17, 18 defendants in the Trump case, there's no way they get a trial done in an expeditious, judicious manner. There's there's, there's absolutely no physical possible way for that to happen. You say you want to begin the case in October, you want a speedy trial in October, it's going to take you a year to pick a jury. And that's, by the way, that's only two defendants. Not all the defendants want a speedy trial. Mark Meadows is trying to get his trial moved to federal court, and today, federal judge held a hearing on moving Mark Meadows' case to federal court, and I don't know what he will do, uh, and I don't know that it's in his discretion or if it's appealable. I got to do a little more research on that, and it's a very old law, actually, um, that goes back to the founding of the country. What I find remarkable is how dismissive some of the voices on television are about it. Um, Ken Delanian, for example, uh, let me see, do I have this audio here? Yes. Uh, Listen to this. It's a weird 1789 law designed to protect federal officials who are acting under the color of their authority in office. Of course, the biggest argument against uh, Meadows in this situation is you heard the tape there, the the recording. Donald Trump was not acting as president in that moment. But was Mark Meadows in in, um, his capacity as the chief of staff to the president doing the things that a chief of staff Uh, would normally do. He's got, I think, a good argument there. Now, he testified in court earlier today. 
I don't know that I did anything that was outside the scope as Chief of Staff Meadows testified. This is from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. The silver-haired former Republican congressman wearing a Navy suit and striped tie fielded questions from his attorney, George Terwilliger III, Special Prosecutor Anna Cross, and Steve Jones, the U.S. District Judge. Dozens of reporters crowded into the room. Attorneys for several of the other 19 defendants also set in, including Steve Sato and Jennifer Little, Trump's two uh, attorneys. Meadows' testimony is going to continue later this afternoon. He's been charged with violating the anti-racketeering laws and felony solicitation, a violation of oath of office. Over the course of his testimony, Meadows repeatedly emphasized he was acting squarely in his role as the president's top aide in each of the eight incidents called overt acts outlined in the indictment. Some of his justifications ranged from being a gatekeeper to Trump's schedule and making sure the president was informed of developments of interest. He also said there was federal interest in the fair and accurate administration of state elections. Under cross-examination, he was more defensive in justifying his role, especially when the prosecutor pressed him if he was acting on behalf of Trump's re-election campaign rather than being a federal employee. Meadows said he wanted, quote, to make sure elections are accurate, I would assume that has a federal nexus. To win a removal motion, defendants have to clear three hurdles. Show that they were a federal official at the time of the alleged offense. Show their alleged criminal behavior was carried out as part of their official duties. And show they can raise a colorable federal defense. Legal experts say it's a fairly low threshold to clear if valid arguments can be made. So Meadows is going to do that. Now, this is important. In Meadows' motion, he's making a motion to move his case to federal court. Meadows did not make a motion to move the entire case to federal court, just his portion of it. Others have now moved to move the entirety of the case to federal court. Fawny Willis, of course, is opposed. She wants it tried in the state. But if she tries it in the state, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Brian Kemp at the gathering last weekend, said it's not going to happen before the election. So, you know, I mentioned the, the YSL gang case that they've still got to be, they've been going on since January to picking a jury. They haven't even finished picking the jury. That's a case with 17 co-defendants. Now, some have been whittled out over time, but you still have a lot. This, you've got 18, 19 co-defendants. Every single defense attorney gets to participate in voir dire. Every single defense attorney gets to participate. That means that after uh, the the general um, clearing out the jury pool of unwanted candidates, then every single defense attorney gets to question jurors to try to do better vetting of the jury to get the fairest jury pool possible. That's a lot of questions from a lot of lawyers to a pool of probably 1,000 to 2,000 jurors from Fulton County. And then there's the other problem people forget about. I was talking to, to a lawyer last night who's involved in, in the situation. And he said he, he's, he's kind of amazed that people forget this. You know, Fulton County, if this stays in Fulton County, you have Sandy Springs there. You have Roswell. You have Milton, Georgia. You have Johns Creek, Georgia. You have Alpharetta, Georgia. That's a very Republican area. You get one Republican. You got to have a unanimous jury. You get one Republican, they could scuttle the whole case. Now you move it to federal court, what happens in federal court? Federal court, you you get a broader range of possible Republican jurors on the case. Just a single one could somehow make it on the jury and say, absolutely not, I'm not sending the former president to prison. Your whole case is scuttled. The case, if just, just calling this straight, The case I would be concerned about if I were Donald Trump in in his shoes would be the documents case in in Florida. One, if I were Donald Trump, honestly, I'd be kicking myself for for not listening to the lawyers in that case. Donald Trump chose to listen to people who were not lawyers, and those lawyers told him that he had carte blanche as president to say something was classified or not. 
And if he sent it to Florida, it, the presumption on its face is that it's declassified. Now, I know a lot of you have heard that from people you believe, and so you've internalized that this is a no-brainer case that Donald Trump as president could declassify something, except there is a laundry list of precedents that that's not the way it works. There are multiple Supreme Court cases from the Trump administration where Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts, writing for majority, said, you can do what you want to do, but you must follow procedure. And in the Presidential Directives Acts and, and other issues, there's a procedure by which the president declassifies documents. And again, the Supreme Court has said repeatedly during the Trump administration, there are things presidents have the power to do, but there's a process and procedure that must be followed in order to do them. And there is a process and a procedure by which documents can be declassified. And we now know Mark Meadows told the special prosecutor, Jack Smith, that Donald Trump did none of those things. That's why Jack Smith has not indicted Mark Meadows in these cases. If I were Donald Trump, that's the case that would keep me up at night. That's the one most likely for even a jury of Republicans to find him guilty. Because one of the witnesses now flipped on him. The head of security at Mar-a-Lago shared a lawyer with some of the, the one of the defendants. And the head of security is not now going to be charged with a crime and left that lawyer in favor of a federal defender. With the federal defender in tow, he's now changed his story. With the federal defender and not one of Donald Trump's lawyers involved, he's now claiming that Trump and those around him wanted him to delete security footage showing boxes being moved out of the room where the classified documents are. Allegedly, and again, if press reports are to be believed, big if, if press reports are to be believed, this guy is willing to testify that he was under pressure from Trump and others to delete video surveillance footage. The problem for Donald Trump in the classified documents case is that the National Archive sought, our, sought documents. He gave them some. They said, you didn't send us everything, and he said, yes, I did, and so a grand jury was convened. The grand jury then said, send us documents, and they sent more documents after they'd already told the National Archives they sent everything. They then sent additional documents to the grand jury and said that was everything. The grand jury wasn't convinced, and they sent the FBI in, and the FBI found even more classified documents. And the special prosecutor secured the notes of one of Donald Trump's lawyers, and the notes of that lawyer, perfectly legal, there, there are hearsay exceptions, and this would fall under it. The lawyer in his notes recorded that Donald Trump wanted him to hide documents from the FBI. If those things are true, and they appear to be documented, this is the case that I would be worried about. I'm not, I wouldn't be worried about the Fawny Willis case in Georgia. Honestly, it's the case that uh, she's like the dog that caught the car. She grabbed the car by the tire and is about to get run over by her own case. It's too big. It's too unwieldy. There are too many defendants. I was talking to, to a lawyer last night who is involved in the case. I mean, just, just take the Jen Ellis matter. You know, I talked about the jury and how long it's going to take for the jury to get picked. Uh, then, you know, Jen Ellis files a motion and says, uh, I shouldn't be a part of this case. I should be dismissed. That's going to make its way to the Georgia Court of Appeals, then to the Georgia Supreme Court, maybe to the Georgia, or maybe to the U.S. Supreme Court. And that's got to be decided before the case goes to trial. If it's a motion to dismiss, it's got to be tried. You can't try her pending an appeal on a motion to dismiss. So that's going to postpone her. You start postponing all these people. Fawny Willis is the dog that caught the car by the tire while the car is in motion. It's not going to end well for her. The Alvin Bragg case in New York is probably going to get dismissed. Uh, what Alvin Bragg is trying to do in New York has never in the history of the republic been done successfully, and he's too stupid to get it done successfully. Trying to impute a state crime to Donald Trump by claiming he broke a federal crime for which he hasn't been charged is a heavy, heavy lift for the best prosecutor, and Alvin Bragg's not that. So you have two cases to be concerned about, 
and they're both the Jack Smith cases. And the in the January 6th case, it's really hard to convict Donald Trump for the January 6th case when, in fact, the January 6th case is premised on the idea that Donald Trump did more than just question the integrity of the election. Some of you absolutely epistemically believe he did, but good luck convincing a jury of that. The Fawny Willis case is only significant because of RICO, because it's very broad. But you start chipping away at that case, it's too complex, it's too unwieldy, it's going to be hard to get a jury to go along with it. But all of this means that Donald Trump is going to be spending a ton of money on lawyers in the next year, and every dollar he spends on lawyers is a dollar he's not spending on the campaign trail, which I guess is what Democrats want. But it's going to be very hard for him to successfully engage a campaign, and don't look now, his polling is starting to slip. I am a small businessman. The company that I run for my radio show, it's a small business. I've got employees. I don't have HR. You may be in that situation, and you may really need HR. Well, you may want to talk to Bambi. When running a business, your employees can create all sorts of interesting situations, and they could get you in trouble. What happens when two employees are squabbling? One of them smells bad all the time. What do you do? How do you navigate the rules? With Bambi, you get access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at just $99 a month. They're available by phone, email, real-time chat. Onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance. Your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. Let Bambi handle your employees for you. Their HR autopilot automates important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. Listen, you want U.S.-based HR managers who give you experience, expertise, a personal touch you need to make it seem like they're a part of your team. They can cost eighty grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 a month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now. Type in Eric Erickson under podcast when you sign up. It'll help you. It'll help your company grow. It'll help you keep peace of mind. It's spelled B-A-M-B-E-E. Bam. B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Eric Erickson. Hello there. Welcome. Did you hear we may be having an auto workers strike? Sean Fain, president of the auto United Auto Workers Union, has declared war on the Detroit Three with contract demands that he calls audacious. He wants a 46% raise, a return to traditional pensions, and a 32-hour work week, which is absurd. Uh, as a 54-year-old, he began work as an electrician at a Chrysler casting plant in 1994. He's threatening to take his 150,000 UAW members out on strike if he doesn't have contracts with General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis. Uh, by September 14th, uh, remember it used to be Chrysler, now it's Stellantis, uh, Jeep and Chrysler models, and I guess Dodge. The deadline is the deadline, he said. Uh, Fain, whose demeanor leans more Sunday school teacher than fire-breathing union boss, this is Bloomberg writing, has brought back a tough-talking style evoking the labor movement's roots. He's part of a new generation of leaders, like the International Brotherhood of Teamsters President Sean O'Brien, who earlier this month won a historic five-year contract with UPS, and Lynn Fox, president of Workers United, who unionized 350 Starbucks stores. These aggressive labor leaders want to rewrite the social compact. Of course, they're being made to be heroes in this, but y'all, really? Um, there's no way that the automakers can really meet these demands. Um, notice the surge in unionism emboldened by Joe Biden. It's going to wreck his economy. Um but hey, if you want to try to get a 30 hour work week, God bless you. Now, I got to tell you about Americans for Prosperity because they're going around the country talking about reigniting the American dream instead of killing all business in America. They want to reignite the American dream for entrepreneurs and small businesses, and they want you to be a part of it. All you got to do is go to AmericansforProsperity.org slash Eric today. AmericansforProsperity.org slash E R I C K. You go sign up with AFP. You learn how to be an activist, a more effective activist learning how to knock on doors, how to talk to your neighbors, how to talk to your state legislators and, and local government about deregulating, expanding the American dream, uh, reigniting the American economy. You do all of that with Americans for Prosperity. They teach you how to be a more informed, better activist, a more persuasive activist, and they give you all the tools and knowledge you need to make it happen. What you do, go to americansforprosperity.org slash Eric and sign up today. 
You can be a part of the bus tour around the nation to reignite the American dream and educate voters on how bad Bidenomics is. It's americansforprosperity.org slash E-R-I-C-K. More than 4 million people have signed up. They become better, more effective activists thanks to americansforprosperity.org slash Eric. Greetings and welcome. It's Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number 877-973-7425 if you want to be on the program. Um, I keep mentioning this hurricane. You know, events change things. Uh, It was one of uh, the British prime ministers, and now all of a sudden I've said it for years and suddenly it escapes me. Um, oh, which one was it? Nah, I, I, it, it doesn't matter. He was asked how his premiership would be rated, and he said, um, or what, what could throw him off? What he wanted to do, and he said, events, dear boy, events. He, events change things. Events do change things. Ron DeSantis has been struggling for a second look. If events things, sorry, half Swedish and half English, half American. My tongue sometimes goes in multiple directions. If events change things and DeSantis is in search of a second look from voters, he may get it this week with the shooting in Jacksonville, Florida and a hurricane approaching the state. DeSantis has suspended his campaign. Uh, His wife is serving as a surrogate. So my buddy, Congressman Jeff Duncan up in uh, South Carolina, does a big event every year. And Casey DeSantis will be going to it while Ron stays home to be governor of Florida. He will be judged on his emergency management preparations. And undoubtedly, the Democrats will seize on anything. I guarantee you, I am a thousand percent convinced Mainstream media outlets have already written their stories about what a hypocrite Ron DeSantis is for taking federal uh, disaster relief money. You know it, and I know it. Uh, but DeSantis is already uh, ur- taking to the airwaves, urging people to listen to their local governments, urging people to prepare for an evacuation, urging people to get a plan together right now. He is out there on the stage, uh, a world stage, really, because all eyes are on him and how he's going to handle it, telling people that they got to come up with a plan right now. They've got to do something fairly immediately that a hurricane is coming, and it's probably going to blow through the middle of Florida. He's also, he went yesterday to Jacksonville, Florida, to participate in memorializing and honoring the dead who had been shot and killed He spoke out against white supremacy and violence. The left attacked him for showing up, but he was doing one of the duties as governor of Florida. These things do matter because they do allow him a crisis, and in crisis, an opportunity to reset himself. And people in Iowa are paying attention for the bait. This is Dasha Burns from NBC. Well, look, Alex, no surprise that Iowa was the first stop for Governor DeSantis after that debate where he is trying to capitalize on the momentum on that win that you mentioned polls are indicating for the Florida governor because this is a state where he is investing really heavily. And look, from what we're seeing on the ground here, he does seem to be getting a lot of momentum. We're in a very small town right now, and he had a pretty good-sized crowd at a VFW hall here And I got to tell you, Alex, look, I know the numbers show Trump is way ahead in the polls. But when you are on the ground here, it does not feel like Trump has this in the bag. Almost every voter I meet here in Iowa is undecided. And what surprises me, Alex, is that I'm meeting voters who say they're considering Trump, but they're also considering others. And that's surprising because you would think that people who are considering the former president, that he would be their only guy. But he's not. In fact, I'm meeting a Trump, maybe Trump DeSantis voter. That's helpful for DeSantis, particularly as uh, these these core crises encroach on Florida right now, this, this tragic shooting and also this hurricane. He's been giving updates and meeting with emergency management. He's been seen. He's also um, beefing up security dollars for Edward Waters University. Edward Waters University is a campus 
where the gunman apparently uh, approached the area. He wants to beef up security. Before I get into Idalia, uh, we do have an update uh, on the Jacksonville shooting. I was uh, working with uh, some of the local officials as well as the president of Edward Waters College uh, to see what kind of support we can provide. So I'm uh, pleased to be able to announce uh, we're going to be able to do $1 million to Edward Waters College to increase security on campus. As I've said for the last couple of days, we are not going to allow uh, our HBC used to be targeted uh, by these people, and so we're going to provide security help with them. We also have FDLE on site uh, today evaluating security on campus and making recommendations for any additional infrastructure improvements. Uh, also, uh, per the request at yesterday's vigil, uh, we're able to do $100,000 to the charity that's supporting uh, the victims' families, and those funds are all uh, coming from Volunteer Florida. So we're going to continue to work with those folks uh, in the days and weeks ahead. So DeSantis gets to look like a leader, and a leader in action, a leader on the move, at a time that voters are starting to look at him again. He definitely had a strong performance on the debate stage, and that definitely allows the voters to reassess him. And now along comes this hurricane and tragedy, and he gets to show what he's made of. But he's not alone don't look now, but the crowds are growing at Nikki Haley Functions. Now, she's in South Carolina where you expect the crowds to be largest, but her campaign has had to change venues even in, in New Hampshire and in Iowa because people are showing up in larger numbers than originally expected. Her campaign moment on that debate stage against Vivek Ramaswamy where she called him out uh, was a kind of powerful moment. Once Russia takes Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics are next. That's a world war. We're trying to prevent war. Look at what Putin did today. He killed Pergozin. When I was at the UN, the Russian ambassador suddenly died. This guy is a murderer, and you are choosing a murderer over, over a pro-American country. I wish you well in your future career on the boards of Lockheed and Raytheon. You know, I'm not on but the, the fact of, of the matter, and and you know, Boeing you came off of it, but you've been, this this you've been pushing this lie. You've been pushing this lie all week, Nikki. You want Nikki. to go and defund Israel? This, you want to okay, give let me address that. China? I'm glad you, you brought that up. Go and give I'm going to address. Russia? So you the reality make is, America less safe. You have no foreign me, policy experience, and it shows. And you know what? The foreign policy experience that you have. Look. You, whether you like her or not, I, I'm, I'm, she's a friend. I, I like her. Um, that was a strong performance on the debate stage. It has ruffled the feathers of pro-lifers, her exchange with Mike Pence. But the foreign policy stuff uh, shows she knows her stuff. And she's getting another look. Her crowd size is growing. We're starting to see momentum in post-debate polling for her. Vivek Ramaswamy is getting a poll bump as well although his not as much as uh, it looks like Haley and DeSantis. And all of it is coming from lower-tier candidates, but also a little bit from Donald Trump. Now, Trump is still in the lead. He's still the big dog. The, the question, though, is when you look at general election polling and this growing sense among voters in the general election that he's got problems— does it begin to transcend to the uh, primary electorate? I, I'm not sure it does. But when you look at the, the national polling right now, you got Donald Trump is at 53% of the polling average, DeSantis at 13, Ramaswamy 7.5, Haley up 5. Uh, you're seeing a, a bump up for Haley. You're seeing a bump up for Pence. You're seeing a decline if, from Trump. Trump was at uh, 56%. He's down to 53 DeSantis uh, still seems to be down a little bit at 13% now, so Trump's the guy to beat. The question, though, is where does it go over time? Donald Trump today on Truth Social said there's a rumor that Ron DeSantis is dropping out to run against Rick Scott for the Senate. It's not true. Set people buzz. It's really not true. Um, but the, the larger issue there is that Trump still thinks he's got to take shots at Ron DeSantis, which does make you wonder, what is his campaign seeing? If, if Ron DeSantis is at 12%, 13% polling, 
and Trump is at 53%. Why even bother with DeSantis? Focus on Joe Biden. Focus on the Democrats. You, you've got it in the bag. The fact that he's not suggests his polling internally, they're seeing something. And I suspect that the reason they're doing it is because we don't pick the Republican or the Democratic nominees based on national polling. We don't all go to the polls on the same day. Iowa goes first, then New Hampshire, South Carolina and Nevada after them, and then other states. Dasha Burns, you heard her say, DeSantis appears to be getting more momentum. As the trials begin in these cases against Donald Trump, as the indictments proceed, as people begin to cut deals, momentum can still change. There are always going to be people who hitch their wagon to Donald Trump and never let it go. And that's their choice. Fine for them. They think Trump's their guy and they're going to stick with him. The question, though, becomes, are they the majority or not? And I, I don't know the answer to that. Right now, they're the majority. But as it goes on, and we have a tick, 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 tick as we get closer in time to the election, as we get closer in time to trials, as more evidence comes out, where does this go? Where does this leave us? Right now, we don't know. But what we do know for certain is that DeSantis is beginning to get a second look. And it comes at a time that's most opportune for him because the job of a governor comes to life during an emergency an emergency like a hurricane. It comes to life in a situation like uh, the, the terrible shooting in Florida where he has to be a leader. He has to be a statesman. He has to unite people. These things help him tremendously. They cause him to get a second look. And meanwhile, on the campaign trail, Nikki Haley's strong debate performance, giving her another look as well. I don't know where this race will ultimately wind up. If it were today, if the election were held today, undoubtedly Donald Trump would win, but the election's not today. We're still months away. We have more debates. And in those debates, Donald Trump's not going to the debates. How many things can Donald Trump do to counter-program these future debates? The counter-programming with Tucker Carlson fell flat. With astronomical Twitter views, nobody actually watched it. Nobody actually heard it. Nobody actually uh, saw him say anything new. It didn't make any news. It actually is remarkable for all of the, the, the buzz and hullabaloo about the number of views Tucker Carlson's getting in these Twitter videos. Nobody seems to know anything that happened in that interview. It made no news. The media ignored it because people ignored it. You can't ignore a hurricane. You can't ignore a shooting. And you can't ignore the people leading in those. It provides DeSantis the moment he needs for a rebound. The question, however, for DeSantis is, is the campaign ready? He's gone through some turmoil in the campaign. He's gone through some shakeup in the campaign. So is the campaign ready? Can the campaign focus? And can the campaign broaden its reach? If I were the DeSantis campaign, I would do this. I would say focus exclusively on Florida this week. Be as leaderly as you can. Send your wife everywhere she needs to go. Let your wife do as many TV interviews as possible. She is a savvy person. You focus on Florida. Next week, next week, you do as many local interviews everywhere in the nation as you possibly can. You go on any television channel that wants you, say for MSNBC. You do as much CNN and Fox News and Newsmax as you can. You go on local uh, TV outlets in New Hampshire and in Iowa and in South Carolina, and you tell the people what you've done. If DeSantis wants this rebound, his campaign's got to execute, and his campaign has had trouble executing. Now is his opportunity. Now is his time to shine. We'll see if he can pull it off. If not, I guarantee you, Nikki Haley will be able to. I want to read for you a paragraph from Bloomberg News. The outlook for the federal budget right now is essentially unprecedented. Crisis-sized deficits, as far as the eye can see, even though the economy appears to be in good health. That prospect is making investors uneasy, as demonstrated by yields on benchmark 10-year treasuries climbed over 4.3% this week, their highest level since 2007. Other borrowing costs are rising in tandem. The average rate on a 30-year fixed mortgage has surged above 7% for the first time in more than two decades. 
Listen to this audio from Fox News. Talk about the economy. That's what voters are talking about. Yeah, the national average for a gallon of gas today, that's $3.82, about where it was a year ago, but 68 cents higher than two years ago. Now, combine that with the cost of a new home, and Americans are paying the highest they have in 22 years. The average 30-year fixed-rate mortgage increased to 7.23% last week, a strain that buyers have not seen since 2001. A year ago, it was 5.5%. The rate surge comes as the Federal Reserve continues to try to chip away at stubborn inflation. And Americans are feeling it overall, everywhere they turn. According to the latest Fox News poll, 35% of registered voters this month reported that their personal financial situation is excellent or good. Now, 65% reported only fair or poor. That second number up 19 percent from two years ago. Inflation in the economy consistently rank as top concerns for voters, but President Biden feels confident that his economic efforts are paying off and that embracing the term Bidenomics will earn him a second term. I really think that's a strategic mistake by the Biden administration because I still think an economic downturn is coming and it may be a jobless recession. That's what they're uh, calling it. A um, You're not going to lose your jobs. There aren't going to be mass layoffs. There's a labor shortage in this country, but you are going to see a slowdown of economic activity. And by the way, don't look now, but that's what's happening with China. The Chinese have gone into an actual depression. That is, prices are cratering in China, and more and more people are headed towards unemployment in China. That will, of course, however, free up oil reserves for us from around the world that should lower prices depending on how quickly the Saudis restrict things. But that that sort of stuff matters. We do live on a planet that is interconnected. Uh, the Chinese economic turmoil is going to have problems across the country. I mean, just, just here, l- listen to this real quick. China's economy was meant to drive a third of global economic growth this year. So its dramatic slowdown in recent months has sounded alarm bells around the world. Policymakers are breaking, bracing for a hit to their economies as China's imports of everything from construction materials to electronics slide. Caterpillar Inc. says Chinese demand for machines used on building sites is worse than previously thought. President Biden calls the economic problems a ticking time bomb. Global investors have already pulled more than $10 billion from China's stock market with most of the selling in blue chips. The Chinese economy is in free fall. That's going to have an effect on us. Um, we are a top export destination for China. Um, and with China's economy wobbling, that's going to impact us. With our economy wobbling, that's going to impact them. It's it's the symbiotic relationship between the two. And our policymakers aren't sure of how to handle this because they still got to get inflation down. And with gas prices up the way they are, they're expecting another bad report. Jerome Powell this past weekend said that he expects interest rates to continue to go up. The stock market was not thrilled with the idea of interest rates continuing to go up. Homeowners are not. The median household now can't afford a house in this country. The average home price in this country now is more than six times median income. People are being priced out of markets. All of this suggests something bad and destabilizing coming to an economy at a time Joe Biden is proudly championing Bidenomics. Now, you and I know if the economy tanks, the media will memory hole his embrace of Bidenomics. But the American people will remember he touted Bidenomics as some sort of successful thing, and they're not feeling it. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.